I'm over at Mason Neck State Park now. Trees are gorgeous, nice and uh, pretty woods. Um, I am on the west side of the primary trail uh, connections here. Everything kind of chokes down to one parking lot unless you're down at the beach. And uh, so that's where I am. I'm going to do the Doge Trail and then out and back on Meadowview, back through Wilson Spring and around Bayview and back at least. And then I might do the other side if I have time, but uh, that will at least, uh, that's like a couple of, a couple of lollipops strung together with an out and back in the middle. Um, so I'm out on the uh, Meadowview Trail now, which kind of follows this little creek valley. I've been in and out of it a couple of times already. But, uh, yeah, just thinking out loud, I'm philosophical a little bit here. I was, uh, National Geographic this month had a wonderful piece on, uh, on Greater Yellowstone. And there was some stuff that went along with that that was, uh, you know, pretty interesting discussion of the paradox of the managed wild. By which, you know, they, they mean that people go to places like Yellowstone and even places like this because they are tourists you know they want to get out and they want to see things and they want to experience things and they want to be a part of the outdoors but um, there's an expectation there that this is something that has been set up for people to have that kind of enjoyment. Uh, that's not true. Uh, you know, the, the idea that when you go to Yellowstone or any place, I mean, the, the, the fact is that you're walking into the wilderness. There's nothing out there to keep an angry animal from defending its territory an angry mother from protecting her cubs. Um, you are in the wilderness. Uh, and so there's this balance of how do we keep nature natural but still allow enough people to see it that they have a sense of ownership, of stewardship, of the understanding and the belief that it needs to be protected. Um, you can't get that kind of understanding unless you allow people to be a part of it. But by being a part of it, you kind of mess it up a little bit, right? So, you know, I, I, it's a real struggle. I was torn, you know, I was reading something here not too long ago about a wilderness area that was looking to just ban people for a while in order to let the populations rebound. And there's a there's an element there of, well, if you're going to set aside all this land and not let any people get in there, what's the point? And the point is, you know, a recognition that our presence destroys things to some extent. On the other hand, we're part of the natural world too, if we act that way. And it's sort of one of those, you know, if the tree falls in the forest and nobody else is around, do we hear it? We're, we're kind of, you know, if there's a wilderness area and there's wonderful ecosystems, but we're not there to be a part of it, does it really matter that it's there? Um, sort of a self-centered view of the world. You know, I have similar struggles when I think of SeaWorld and the orcas and all of that. And, you know, I, I understand the feeling that you know, these orcas are very intelligent creatures and they've been in captivity all their lives and they're, it's unnatural and, oh man, that resonates. I mean, you want them to be free. On the other hand, how many people have their only exposure to this animal through places like SeaWorld and other zoos and places that are breeding and doing scientific research on, on endangered and rare animals. You know, not that the orca is necessarily all that rare, but um, there's something about human nature, though, that, you know, we 
We don't seem to want to care about something unless we've seen it, we know it. Pictures go a long way, but you know, there's this visceral feeling of experience that we need. And if it's, you know, the old saying, out of sight, out of mind. So how do you balance things like a couple of orcas in captivity with people, I believe, who are honestly doing the best that they can to make the quality of life for that animal as good as they can. And I know some would argue that. But think of the advocacy that those few animals have generated for their entire species. It's really tough. It's really, really tough to figure out how much is enough. How much human interaction is enough. How much involvement is enough. One other thing. This same article that was... No, I don't guess it was the same article. I saw a National Geographic clip on YouTube. They were talking about taking pictures of Grand Teton. The biggest challenge that the photographers had, they actually had to rope things off and cordon things off because they couldn't get nice pictures of the iconic Grand Teton range without the shot being full of people. <laughs> you go there and there are people everywhere. Um, yeah, you can get way off trail and be away from it, but the views that you see, you're never alone in those shots. Old Faithful, you know, you can't get to without walking on, you know, basically a deck with a hotel right next door. And I get it. But, have we eroded the experience in order to make sure that people know about it? And again, how much is enough? It's a real challenge. Shortly after Yellowstone was first created, land managers there were basically touting it as a drive through zoo. <coughs> they called wolves, they killed bears, because they wanted the elk population to be nice and impressive. They had dumps with drive-in viewing of the bears that would come in and eat garbage <coughs> until they realized that, you know, making bears dependent on human handouts maybe not be a good idea for bears or people. They stocked all the streams with trout because they wanted the fishermen to be able to just reel them in and have a great time. <laughs> it all seemed like a good idea at the time. But uh, the lake trout have almost destroyed the yellow cutthroat population out there. Again, this is National Geographic recent recent article. <coughs> and the uh, wolf debate and bear debate has been raging ever since. It's hard. But it all comes back to this idea that uh, that somehow it's for us. You probably can't see it, but there's a pair of bald eagles right there. This is the namesake overlook of the Meadowview Trail. And just out there I can see, I don't believe that's the Potomac, I believe it's another little bay, but um, I'm going to have to head over that way and see what I can find. I'm curious about where this eagle nest is though, it looks like they came back and landed in the tree just to my left.
might be able to see the beaver dam out there. It's an osprey circling. Not a beaver dam, a beaver lodge. And this is really neat. There's a couple of really long boardwalks out to this tiny little island overlooking Belmont Bay. Let's go take a look. This is Belmont Bay. We're kind of looking northwest back off of Mason Neck. The Potomac is back out here to the left. Alright, so I'm walking back up. Wilson Spring. I've got maybe a half a mile to go. And it's 10:15, which means I got to get over and see a bunch of British cars, <laughs> which will be fun. Um, really like this place. It's a nice area. Uh, nice trails. Um, good variety. Lots of wildlife. I, uh, you know, squirrels are everywhere, obviously. But I also saw three herds of deer, whitetail. Uh, that ran off when I got close to them. Actually, a couple of them just came tearing across the path in front of me. Don't know what they were running from, but it wasn't me that started it. Um, and, uh, yeah, hearkening back to my other theme, I'm aware of the irony of thinking it's cool to see the boardwalks across the marsh and up onto the island uh, after talking about, you know, accessibility and all of that and how much do we improve the woods um, I know, I mean, I, I think back on all the places that I couldn't have gotten to, I couldn't have seen, uh, had it not been for a boardwalk, a bridge, uh, you know, even just constructing a trail that switchbacks instead of going straight up the side of a waterfall, you know, there's certainly value in funneling people, right, <laughs> while you're, uh, making it accessible. You, make people all go in the same place, it keeps it safer, minimizes impact, all that, so. I, yeah, it's just, it's hard. Um, I guess we all want to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, and uh, finding balance in everything is, is challenging, but I don't know, it seems increasingly this kind of stuff is on my mind and on our collective minds when we worry about you know, rising sea levels and warming temps and melting ice caps and all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, you know, we're foolish to think that things don't change. Uh, the world has uh, accomplished an awful lot without us. And I still come back to thinking that, you know, we're a bit prideful to, to try to boil everything down to what have humans done cause or effect or save or harm um, and in the end you know the ecosystem and everything in it will figure out a way to do without us um, I don't know hard to be what we are as a technological animal an exploring animal a developing animal and not try to impose that or otherwise lose track of everything that works hummingly <laughs> without really caring about us much at all. Anyway, hate to get all philosophical, philosophical today. And just, uh, you know, our, these things get on your mind when you're out in the woods. <laughs> 